It's time for another episode of The Cultural Hall, and I thought about it multiple times about how I wanted to do this episode. In fact, one of the ways I thought is that I would just have our guest start talking and see how many people would find her voice familiar. Uh, we've recommended multiple times on different occasions here in The Cultural Hall, the Bundyville podcast. It's my pleasure to finally welcome into The Cultural Hall, Leah Satilli. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, uh, people uh, won't know. In fact, I don't even think you remember. I originally contacted you maybe five or six years ago. We did the the juggle back and forth. We had a time set for whatever reason. I think it was probably on my end. Life was a little crazy. It didn't work out. And then, I mean, as a freelance journalist, y- y- you've just been sitting around waiting for me to email you. So totally. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been you've been, Finally. In, you've been in a bunch of products uh, uh, on projects and and I'm just grateful to be able to have this chat with you today. Um, in a recent episode of the Culture Hall, we talked with Nate Eaton from East Idaho News, who threw all sorts of props your way. Oh, that's because nice. Because of with your book, When the Moon Turns to Blood, about uh, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, that you were someone that uh, not only sort of quoted research, but also that you could tell you're not just trying to jump in on the bandwagon of let's talk about people who murder people because we know that gets the clicks and all that stuff. But before right. we get into that, before we get into Bundyville, I want to know what a young Leah Satilli, like, what was she like? What made her decide the life of a freelance journalist was the thing that she wanted to do? Oh, it's interesting. I mean, I've always wanted to be a journalist and I knew that there was something about it that was appealing to me. So you know, I'm one of the few people that started college as a journalism major and finished as a journalism major, uh, especially at the school I went to. Um, But, you know, I think really a big motivator for me was alternative media. So, you know, you probably remember there, there was a thing called alternative news weeklies, which Mm -hmm. are not really a thing anymore, but in Salt Lake, there's the the Salt Lake weekly and things like that still. Uh, That was a really motivating thing for me because I liked how they were doing journalism, but it was about, it was deeper, it was more investigative, and it was about people that might be overlooked by the rest of society Hmm. um, or by mainstream media. So that was really appealing to me. That's kind of where I got my start in journalism was alt-weekly newspapers. But, you know, I was also somebody that was really, really into the music scene as a kid. So really, you know, I grew up in in suburban Portland and was always kind of going to shows in Portland and Seattle. And so really one of my first jobs was that as the music editor of the Alt Weekly in Spokane, Washington, mm-hmm. where I, you know, really just spent most of my time kind of jumping in band vans and going on, you know, tour dates and um, trying to kind of, root out the really interesting subcultures around Eastern Washington and North Idaho. And um, yeah, that's, I mean, so young me was very much like how I am now, but a lot more motivated by the music scene and, and (laughs) that kind of thing. Well, and you, and you take a, I mean, maybe it's the same thing, but just in a different sort of path, but you, you take it certainly a shift into things. um, I want to say far more serious because I think that diminishes music, but the the subject of which you investigate are passionate about uh, is, is a far cry uh, from music. Now, yeah. you know, you talk about religious extremism and 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 a lot of these things that that isn't jumping in a tour van and and talking about well their set wasn't that great or you know I really wish they added that thirteenth song. Take us from there to here. Well, it's interesting because sometimes I think because I did that work as a music journalist for so long, I think it actually kind of set me up to be able to talk about political and religious extremism in a weird way. I think it's because, you know, to do that job successfully, you have to be really good at talking to people who might feel like outcasts or who are like sort of living on on the edges of society, whether or not they've like put themselves there or they feel that they've been pushed there. And I think that's really common in music scenes to find people who are sort of like rejecting norms or pushing away from mainstream society. Um, so really when things started to change for me was in 2014, I actually wrote a story for Playboy magazine about a uh, a guy who was a doomsday prepper in, in Eastern Washington. And he took me through his kind of bunker that he had set up and showed me all of his firearms and his canned food and his, you know, plan to survive what he thought would be like a nuclear apocalypse. And it was just really intriguing for me. I mean, I, I, I couldn't come at it with any judgment. I was just like, wow, people people live like this. This is a big investment of time and money. 
So it sort of set me up for then when in early 2016, the Bundy brothers took over the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon, where I live. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of was really the thing that sent me sort of tumbling down a rabbit hole that I have continued to to fall down for the last few years is trying to understand, well, why did they take over that refuge? What does that have to do with, you know, public lands and um, coming to understand all of the people that gathered at that 41 day standoff. Um, they were not, you know, ranchers or land rights activists by and large, but they were people just sort of on the far right wing of society who had a lot of ideas about how the world should be. Now, you yourself, uh, are you a, a religious person? Some of this, or I, I think obviously the reason why we come to this for the cultural hall is that there is that, you know, sort of uh, interwoven part through um, both mainstream beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and also these ones where we go, yeah, 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 no, they're they're saying we believe that, but we don't actually, let's correct that sort of thing, or that's a little bit extreme of what it is. Are you yourself a religious person? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't think I've, people ever really asked me that directly. Um, I guess I should say, you know, I grew up, I went to Catholic school, I went to Gonzaga University, I went to a Catholic college, and um, would not call myself, a, you know, at a certain point in my life, I was a very church going religious person. Um, since have kind of fallen away from that, I would say that I am a spiritual person, but not mm -hmm. necessarily a religious person. So so I believe in you know, um, other things, I guess, that are a little bit more uh, less tangible with facts and data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and so uh, you have this uh, this incident. And if people don't remember, maybe 30 second recap of the taking over uh, in Oregon. Let's let's set that stage for folks. Sure. I'm good at this. OK. January 1st, 2016, uh, a group of armed men took over a remote bird refuge in eastern Oregon called the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. And they held that federal property for 41 days um, because of their you know, beliefs that the federal government shouldn't own land. But a lot of their anti-government um, even extreme white supremacist worldviews were on display during that refuge standoff. So that, you know, that played out for 41 days. It, it, it resulted in a very big federal trial in Oregon in which the main players in that standoff were all acquitted by a jury. Mm -hmm. So a uh, very interesting kind of incident of, of um, you know, the far right sort of escalating and, and doing doing things in the name of their ideology. And so uh, you just become like, man, this is this is a thing I'm interested in. It's knocking on my door. Let's go after it. Or was it someone came to you and said, hey, you're good at this. This is going on here. Make this project. How did that how did Bundyville come about? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of both. So at the time, I was a stringer for the Washington Post, which sort of meant that if something rose to the level of national you know, interest to the national media in Oregon, they'd send me to cover it. So it's actually kind of funny for people who live in the West. Um, my editors at the Washington Post said, hey, this refuge standoff is happening. Can you can you go cover it? And I said, cool, sounds good. I'll be there in six hours. And they're like, we need you there faster. <laughs> I was like, that's just how long it takes to get there. Yeah. Like, it's just, I can't get there faster. So it, 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 long story short, they ended up sending someone from Boise, which is actually closer. And I covered the court end of things for that. So covered all the court proceedings involving all of these people. I mean, there was over a dozen people who were who were seeing charges for that standoff and they were acquitted. There was then a subsequent trial that happened in Las Vegas regarding an earlier armed standoff that happened with this a lot of the same people in Nevada. And that resulted in a mistrial. So, you know, after two both of those, the the federal government really had a, tried to get the quote unquote get these people and mm -hmm. they didn't. And I had a lot of questions that really didn't get answered because those trials, you know, did, went sort of differently than I think everyone wanted them to. I think I also understood, you know, there was something more to what was happening than just what was being said into microphones. Mm -hmm. It felt religious to me. And I think it was because I had grown up around sort of religious speak and, and words and 
had a lot of Mormon friends when I was a kid and I'd heard people say, oh, well, this is a Mormon thing. And I was like, what, what is that? That doesn't make any sense to me. You know, and I felt that that was really a generalization and very unfair. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, if it is at all related to Mormonism, then what, what does that mean? So, so really, I think it's that it was that I had questions and I felt that people had been pretty unfairly maligned. Um, so I, I wanted to essentially sit down with the Bundys and ask them, what does this have to do with your religious ideology? And and they answered it. They said it had everything to do with their interpretation of LDS scripture, which is far from a mainstream interpretation. Wait, so it's a fascinating thing. Uh, years and years ago, uh, I got to spend a couple of hours with Ammon Bundy and interviewed him. And uh, this, this was... Um, this was after uh, the Nevada standoff, but before Oregon. So that gives you sort of a timeline of this mm -hmm. whole thing. And um, I remember a, a, one of the biggest regrets of my professional life is he said, hey, come down to the ranch and hang out with us and we'll do all this. And because of what was going on in my life, I wasn't able to do that. And then, of course, you know, everything else happened and I, I wasn't able to do it. But one of the things that has sort of stuck in my mind is um, the Nay book. And you talk about this quite a bit in, in the Bundyville. And, and we've talked about it here in the cultural hall quite a bit because you see this even most recently uh, with the Thibodeau case out of uh, Arizona and then Boise and then subsequently Alaska, that there are these people who say, yeah, 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 I know what God means. It means this for me and we need to go and do this. Set precedent or uh, set the table for what the nay book is. And then as you understand it, as I understand you were able to read it, like what as you visit with him about that, what, like, what do you what do you gain from that? It just seems yeah. so it seems so, so much. It was a lot. And and for somebody who didn't grow up in the LDS church, you know, initially I was like, what is it that I'm looking at here? So so to set the stage, I was in Nevada for the trial over their their standoff that they had at their ranch in 2014. And I met with a woman who said, you know, I've got some information I want to tell you. You know, there's a lot of people who say they've got a lot of information they want to tell you about the Bundys or whatever. So but I was there. I took this meeting and she said, have you heard of this thing called the Nay Book? This audio is in Bundyville. And I was like, no, what is that? Like, and then she showed it to me. And, and I realized I had heard rumors about that the Bundys had maybe created their own kind of Book of Mormon. And it just seemed ridiculous. Like, but then when I realized what she was showing me, that was that. So what it is, it's, it's actually, it's not really a book. It's like a packet of papers, probably about 50, 60 pages. And what it is, is that, Cliven Bundy, who's the father of, of the family, the patriarch of the family, he and his neighbor, another rancher named Keith Nay, who is deceased, they spent a lot of their time together looking through LDS scripture and sort of pinpointing things that they thought affirmed their ideas about the white horse prophecy and that they are that it's up to Mormon people to save save the Constitution and um, essentially excuses that they thought meant that it was OK to take up arms against the government. Yeah. So it's really interesting. You know, they he sort of, you know, says, what's the what's the duty of a, a member of the Lord's Church? You know, he sort of sets it up with this letter and then um, goes through. And, and really, it's just kind of uh like almost like highlighted pages and sort of like groupings, like here's everything that talks about like the constitution in the book of Mormon or in Mormon scripture. And so, um, and then it ends with a bunch of writings from Ezra Taft Benson. So, you know, you know, you show this to me, I, a person who grew up in the Catholic church. I'm just kind of like, what am I, what am I looking at here? Yeah. So, so what I then did was sort of uh, took that around and uh, to, to, you know, Mormon scholars, people at BYU, people around the country and said, what, what is it that you see here? And they're like, I do not know what this is. So, <laughs> so um, that kind of sent me on a trajectory of trying to understand, you know, who believes this kind of thing? Is it just the Bundy family? You know, that's a large group of people, but it's, is, is it really enough to talk about? And so, that kind of opened up a bunch of reporting about the white horse prophecy, which is this sort of, you know, LDS urban legend that, you know, it's up to the Mormon people to save the constitution in the future. It will hang by a thread as fine as silk fiber, as they yeah, say. I was just going to say, you have to make sure you throw in the hanging by a thread because we really yeah. like that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By yeah. a thread, that piece of paper that doesn't have thread. 
that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so it's hanging by a thread, and you know, these these people will will save it in the future. Which is, you know, the the mainstream church says that we have nothing. This, there's no evidence. This is real. Joseph Smith never said it. It's fake. It's urban legend. But nonetheless, a lot of people want to believe it, and <laughs> that's kind of the conclusion that I came to was that the Bundys were really tapping into <clears throat> their belief in that uh, urban legend, and it represented more than just them. You know, in the first season of Bundyville, I say, you know, this is super fringe, not a lot of people believe it or whatever. After that season came out, I got a lot of emails from people who were like, no, 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 it's more it's more common than you think. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more people who are kind of talking about this um, behind closed doors or, you know, outside of church. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where it began for me. And so I thought, well, for me to do this, you know, this lady can give me this thing, but I got to sit down with the Bundys and ask them about it. So I had the opportunity to interview them for several hours at their ranch. Um, and by them, I mean, Clive and Bundy and his eldest son, Ryan Bundy. I just said, what's the deal with the Whitehorse prophecy? You guys believe that? And they're like, absolutely. And have you seen the Nay book? And they got out their copy and wanted mm -hmm. to show it to me and stuff. So, so it was very interesting to, to learn about that and to understand, you know, the, the mainstream church can say, until they're blue in the face, this is not what we believe, but that doesn't mean that other people won't won't think that it's real. Yeah. I want to take a break real quick. When we come back in the second block, uh, I want to talk about maybe some relationship that this might have to Croc Hours writing in Under the Banner of Heaven and some of those things. We'll come back and do that in the second block of the Cultural Hall. Here in the second block of the Cultural Hall, uh, remember, you can become a Patreon saint of the Cultural Hall. Go to patreon.com forward slash the Cultural Hall, where you get to be a part of the secret but not sacred facebook group where we're all hanging out uh it's patreon.com forward slash the cultural hall so obviously in the last couple of years a lot of hype about under the banner of heaven that huge hulu fx uh show you know croc hours book uh has been on on the top of the list for a long time it resurged and a lot of interest became into it and and i guess i would ask you just on the front of that do you think that there's any difference between, you know, the, the Lafferty brothers and, and what you think, you know, the Bundys either are or could become? I think so, yes. I mean, I, I think that the Lafferty brothers were maybe motivated by similar things. I mean, I have not done reporting on that, on the, that case or anything. I've read mm -hmm. Krakauer's book, obviously, but, you know, they committed acts of violence. I mean, extreme violence and um, in, in the name of their ideologies. The Bundys have not done that. And I think that that's important to, to remember. They're really good at stirring people up and getting people excited. They certainly have welcomed violent people under their wings. You know, uh, Jared and Amanda Miller were at the the Bunkerville standoff in, 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 in Nevada, and uh, they went on to kill a couple of police officers. So, you know, there's certainly people that are 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 attracted to the Bundy's tactics and ideologies. They love their armed standoffs and things like that. But the Bundy's themselves have not said anything to me that, that made me think they could be violent. I mean, I certainly um, have said, you know, we don't want to have another Waco. We don't want to have this. They, they, they use those words, but I think that that would be a pretty in any way. Hmm. Uh, do you so uh, in his book though he sort of assumes that the doctrine of the LDS Church kind of has this um, this uh, you know that we have to be you know sometimes we're going to have to just stand for what's right even if everyone else thinks that that's you know that that's crazy or whatever. Do you think that that similarity between the two different groups and even into Chad and Lori and Thibodeau and and whoever's next? Do you think that that is a a, a kind of a through line through the the church? Yeah, I think, you know, with Chad and Lori, there's certainly a comparison to be made there. You know, there's there's, uh, you know, innocent people that are killed by the Lafferty brothers. There are innocent people that we at least know Lori Vallow has been found guilty of, of committing the, mur the murders of these several people. So um, so I think that comparison is a lot more uh, acute, I think, and appropriate. You know, I think that there is this really interesting thing that you that you raise that that the the Bundys will often say, well, you know, who's no who knows what we're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think the pressure test on that is to look at, you know, COVID and the ways that they were able to sort of use that rhetoric to to recruit people. So like Ammon Bundy, for example, in Idaho was 
sort of i would say you know maybe coming to the end of of his uh his, his um moment you know the trials were over he's out you know what's he going to do next i wrote a story pre covid about how he was kind of hunting around the west for a new thing to kind of startup so he took a lot of interest in this family that had been evicted from their home in a small town in in north idaho and you know he showed up and wanted to see like is this it is this our next standoff and he always uses those words i don't know what we're gonna have to do here mm -hmm. but then COVID hits and it and it really is um you know it was like it was served to to the bundies on a platter as like look at this thing that you can exploit so many people are scared so many people are feeling upset about mask mandates and their businesses shutting down or, you know, <clears throat> myriad issues. We don't, we don't even need to go over again, but those moments are really, really effective for extremists to kind of say, I have an answer. And it means protesting at this hospital. It means showing up, it, it, you know, extremists give somebody who is upset. They give them sort of a, a kind of a radar to focus their anger and energy and fear at, so I think that that was, you know, if anything, that, that, th that's what, when you say that, that's what that makes me think of is that, you know, the Bundys are saying like, Hey, you know, we're going to have to protest this now. And they sort of take their public lands anger and they direct it now at medical, you know, at, at doctors or CPS or things like that. So, um, I do think that, that, that that's disturbing. Um, it's had varying shades of you know, effectiveness. I think that, you know, we're seeing right now that Ahmed Buddy owes like millions and millions of dollars and is has a warrant out for his arrest and all kinds of things right now. So, you know, it, it remains to be seen how effective that will be. But regardless of a leader, it's sort of interesting to me to see how from generation to generation, this idea of like, we're going to have to do what we have to do, the end times are coming, you know, that transcends from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s. It's like, even without a, a main person to drive it, that idea is just kind of in the wind, it gets picked up from generation to generation. And that that's been very interesting for me to report on. Do you think that it's uh, like a mental illness? Is it brainwashing? Because so most recently, it's, for example, in the Thibodeau case, uh, people that don't know, they can go back and listen to our episode with Nate Eaton, where we talk about this. This is essentially uh, a, a woman and her brother. And, you know, it's going to be the end of times and we need to go. And then the uh, daughter calls her husband and says, hey, you need to come home from work. Health emergency. Let's go. He comes home from work. It's not a health emergency. She says it's basically the end of the world. We need to go. And he says, I'm not going with you. So. Like that that person, um, I think Braden is his name, he had said to his wife, and they look like, you know, completely normal people, as they were prepping for things, he's like, yeah, I'm on board to do this. It's probably good that we have, you know, some food storage and a bug out bag, you bet. Uh, you know, uh, uh, an end of the world, sure, I'm a faith believing person, that may happen. Yeah, it, I don't know how or whatever, but sure, I believe that that could happen. But then there's a, a point at some point, where it goes from yeah, I'm just being prepared to, this is now something sort of out of the norm, something that would be identified as extremism or whatever. So, so, so what is it? Is it mental illness? Is it, is it, uh, you know, a brainwashing? Is it uh, obsessive, uh, compulsive something or? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, in the case of Lori Vallow, it certainly is, um, you know, she has myriad mental illnesses that the judge talked about excuse me, during her sentencing. And um, obviously that was good to kind of finally hear, okay, you know, this is part of what was at play here. But, you know, I think that doesn't speak to the fact that like with the Thibodeau case, that there, this has been attractive. This is, that case was so chillingly similar mm -hmm. for, for a few minutes there to the Vallow case, missing teenager, disappeared people who have end times belief systems who've been kind of falling down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. I was so scared that week. Like, oh my God, are we doing this? Or is this, is this becoming this common yeah. that we're doing yeah. this again? And I think that, you know, I'm not sure that brainwashing is, is the right term for it. But what I do think it is, is that this kind of fringe of, of the church offers options in a difficult time to people in fear. 
it gives them something to do. So, you know, prepping is something that is very familiar to a lot of people beyond the LDS church in the West, you know, mm -hmm. where we have earthquakes and all kinds of things and volcanoes and things to be ready for. I think what it does is it takes things that are familiar and just ramps up the volume on all of them and says, you know, uh, you can have control over your life if you prep, but prep harder than anybody else. Mm. And, and I think that there, one thing that was very illuminating to me in reporting the Vallo Daybell case for my book was understanding that there's kind of this subset of the church who, who, who really wants to kind of level up their beliefs, you know, that, that going to church every week and kind of doing what everybody else is doing is almost not enough. They want to be, you know, have more access to, to bigger things, to, um, you know, teachings that are maybe a little bit like less talked about. And, um, within that ecosystem of wanting to level up, you often find like people who are like prep harder, mm -hmm. um, get more firearms, be ready. And it's kind of going back to that fear piece again, it's taking, you know, people's fear in a difficult time and kind of exploiting it. And I think that what's what's difficult and this is far transcends people in the lds church but right now there are so many conspiracy theories out there on facebook or just mm -hmm. on the internet or on whatever you know that come to your phone and there's people are really afraid of of so many different things going on in politics and you know covid etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean name your name your disaster and I'm not sure that everyone has the capacity to be discriminating when these things come their way, because mm. it might offer an answer that they want or that they it may affirm something they already believe. So so I think what's happening with this stuff, with the Thibodeau case, with the Velo Daybell case, in, which is such an extreme circumstance, is it's just sort of emblematic of what's going on nationwide and maybe worldwide of 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 this you know fire hose of information coming at you on your phone and really kind of not knowing what to do with it and sometimes seeing something and being like yeah that actually kind of makes sense to me you know maybe i will show up to this conference where i can learn a little bit more about prepping and be ready um then you add religious belief into that and it could be hard to negotiate people out of those those ideas once they start indulging in them, if that makes sense. When you dive in and you're able to meet these people that are essentially on the front lines of, of um, sharing this and, and you're able to hear it from like Ammon Bundy, from Cliven Bundy, from, you know, these various folks, ha have there been times where you're like, oh yeah, this, this kind of does make sense. And then you have to sort of recenter. Have you been swept up in it at all? No, I'm not, I haven't, but I can understand, especially in the case of the Bundys, to take up arms against the government, to lead these armed standoffs. I mean, that's, there's an investment. Pretty there. Ballsy. It's a pretty it's, ballsy yeah, move. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so to me, I'm like, what is motivating this? You know, and one thing that was very, very illuminating to me and really that I felt, you know, kind of advanced the conversation I could have with Clive and Bundy was I did a bunch of research on Bunkerville, Nevada, 1950s and 1960s, and how that town that ex that specific town was the um took the brunt of a bunch of nuclear fallout from the Nevada test site so like you know cows were getting sick people cancer rates were spiking in this tiny town so i asked him you know you were a kid did that did that you know kind of set the stage for your view of what the federal government you know, how it treats people. And his eyes lit up. He was so glad that I knew that. And he was like, absolutely. Like everyone I knew was getting sick. You know, it was this huge thing. So for me, you know, that wasn't me agreeing with him. It was just, start, it was just understanding that if you live in this tiny remote town and all of a sudden, you know, you realize the cancer rates are spiking because the way the federal government is, is considering the people who live in your, in your town is disposable. Mm -hmm. That might, <laughs> that might build an anti-government belief system pretty early on. You know, I think as far as the other reporting I've done, a lot of times the people who I've spoken to who have helped me understand it are people who were in it. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, we're like, whoa, yep. this is not, I got to back out of this. And so, so it really helps me understand how in so much of the reporting I've done, it has started online. It's just people joining a Facebook group, wanting to meet other moms or, you know, wanting to kind of advance their, their, you know, LDS belief system or wanting to, yeah, just meet 
like-minded people and going to the internet and then before they know it they've sort of started to fall down the rabbit hole and um you know either they're lucky because they have a family member who is like what are you doing (laughs) or they or something happens that's kind of like flips a, a switch in their brain that they're like hang on this is not this is not mormonism this is not you know being a republican this is something more some people just because of subject matter or um, because they they kind of are like, well, that seems a little much. They wouldn't really get into it. They wouldn't uh, be interested in this. I think that it, it, it's valuable for everyone, LDS or not, to know about these things. Why do you think it's valuable that people are aware, able to understand where people come from that get to these places? Because that's one of the things that I love about what you do is it it does it in such a way that I go... I am so grateful that I did Hmm. that listening, that reading, that understanding. I'm glad to hear that. You know, I I think a lot of times I'm trying to test my own, um, you know, things that I might hear in my life or fears that I hear people having. I I just, I I always say I'm not the kind of person that's willing to just adopt other people's fears because that's because that's what they have. Like Mm -hmm. I I have a high bar, I guess, for what I want to be afraid of. So. You know, for me, sometimes I'm trying to understand, um, is this real? Is this something to be afraid of? And and to really live in those spaces. I think um, for, for when the moon turns to blood, I wanted to understand the mindset of people who are on the fringes of the church. So for a couple of years, I was a member of this website called Another Voice of Warning, which, you know, is this kind of catch all for like really hardcore uh, preppers, pe- constitutionalists, you know, sort of people around like that might have assembled around the Bundys and I was on that site when the uh when the last election happened and it was really really interesting to process the world through that that lens to watch you know what I would read on you know the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Salt Lake Tribune about what was happening in the election Mm -hmm. and then go to that website and see like a completely different uh portrayal of what was going on in the world one said this is an election that's happening the other had said we have to be afraid this could be it this might be the time that we need to bug out and stuff so you know to me it's it was so valuable and so like mind-boggling and um i think that that's part of the job of a journalist is to kind of understand that like your own personal perspective on the world is kind of not really valid. It's about understanding that there are myriad, infinite perspectives in in the United States, in in Oregon, in Utah, in Idaho, and and trying to understand, you know, how all these people come together. What happens when when people with very different ideas live in the same place? Yeah, I I guess that, like putting it very plainly for me, I think that there were a lot of people that were surprised about how January 6th occurred. And I would imagine that you're like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like it uh that was a, that was a really hard day for everybody and uh I, I actually happened to be just wrapping up a project that I was doing with the BBC at the time called 2 minutes past 9, which is sort of a 25 year look back at the Oklahoma City bombing. My producer and I would, you know, she was in London, I'm in Portland, we're like 8 hours apart, so we would meet in the morning and and in her afternoon. And that day January 6th happened we were on a call and she just started recording and saying like what are you processing how are is you know and I started crying and you could even hear me cry I mean I'm not a big crier and like it was something that was like I was so overwhelmed because I was like man I feel like I've done the best possible job I can to put it out there that this could happen and you can you know, be a journalist and wave your arms just as hard as you can and shout as loud as you can. But it doesn't mean that it's people are going to pay attention or take it seriously. And um, yeah, so that day was was difficult for me because I was like, man, I really feel like I saw this coming and I can't believe it's happening. And I don't really know what else I could have done to be louder about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, 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 100 percent. I want to take another break. Uh, when we come back in the third block, there's a question we ask everyone who steps into the cultural hall. I'll ask that of you. And we'll also find out maybe what's in Leah Satilli's future. Wrap up some other things as well. We'll come back and do that in the third block of the cultural hall. Here in the third block of the cultural hall. Remember, you can always send us an email contact at the cultural hall dot com. 
That is how you can say Leah Satilli was the greatest guest you've ever had. Can she be on again and again? Or if you're like, well, I don't get, I don't get what all the hype is. You can send that email as well. You won't, but you could contact at the cultural hall.com. Uh, this is just a, a softball question that came to my mind. Do you ever write about stuff that's like easy and happy? I mean, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I do. I have started to more and more. Um, I remember in 2019, I was teaching at the university of Montana school of journalism and I had a student say, you know, shouldn't we do good stories? And, you know, I took the very, you know, journalism professor, uh, answer. No, that's not the job. We're here to document what's going on. Since then, I've really budged on that because, you know, I write about really difficult topics and it's, it takes a personal toll. So a few years ago, um, I realized I gotta, I gotta change up these stories from time to time. So I wrote a big story, like about a shipwreck that happened in the 1700s on the Oregon coast. And the woman who sort of solved that and figured out that this, this shipwreck had happened and that there, you know, might be buried treasure and things like that. So that's just an example. I try to kind of take on other things. Um, sometimes I what I would say is like a good topic for me would still be a dark topic for other people. Sure. Um, for example, I did a profile um, a couple of years ago about uh, an LDS man who was considered the godfather of conversion therapy in, in oh. trying to, you know, tell people that their same sex attractions were, were sinful. And he at a certain point was able to say, actually I'm gay. And so I went to pride with him in Salt Lake city. And it was a, it was a delightful story. It was difficult. You know, there was a lot of him reckoning with all the harm that he had done, but also there was a lot of joy there in watching a person say, I feel free. I can be who I am now. So I, so I, I do, I try to find those stories every now and then. Unfortunately, a lot of people send me a lot of really dark topics to work on, and then I do. <laughs> well, uh, but I imagine, though, because of your unique um, experience and perspective, like you're able to to go after it in a way that, you know, both the world and the LDS church is, is glad to have you. We're lucky well, to I, have you. To I, be able I hope to so. That. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, to me, like I said, a big part of my motivation was feeling like, you know, it was really unfair. I thought the way that in the early days of the Malheur standoff, people were really saying, oh, this is a Mormon thing. And I was like, no, it's not like what <laughs> It makes mm -hmm. no sense. And so to me, I also I, I, I often feel like where I come in is when I feel like people in the West are being stereotyped. And I'm mm -hmm. like, no, no, no. Let me do the the like more nuanced, correct version of this story, because I feel like that's what what a journalist is for. You know, LDS people uh, were super missionary minded and, you know, always talking to people and, you know, wanting to share the gospel and, the, and those kind of things with you. I'm curious if you've ever had anyone engage you that didn't know what you did sort of professionally and be like, yeah, do you know about the New Mormon church? And you're just like, do I? <laughs> A little bit. I mean, I think um, not maybe not as much as you would think. Uh, sometimes people will. I have had actually people say. I've heard this great podcast. It's all about the Bundy family. And I'll be like, oh yeah, totally. That's, I actually, I made that. And they're like, oh, I knew your voice sounded familiar. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's kind of fun. That's kind of yeah. a fun little thing where you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing. Yeah, I do that. I, yeah, that I totally, me. I totally know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, so people will send you all sorts of things. What do you decide or how do you decide rather, you know, Hey, here's a wild thing. You could chase wild things all day, every day for the rest of your life and not be sure. able to do it. What What is the kind of the meter that you put it to that you go, okay, I'm going to do this. I won't do this. How do yeah. you? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, 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 that's a really good question. I think that um, when it comes to extremism, I, f I am not somebody that's just interested in writing about, you know, extremists exist, period. And here's, mm -hmm. you know, story three, four, five, six, seven on that. What I am interested in doing is anything that I feel like advances the conversation so we can learn more, so readers can feel more informed about the world around them. So, you know, if somebody sends me an idea and I'm like, that's interesting, I haven't heard a lot about that. Maybe mm -hmm. there's something there I can dig into. Um, I think I also, uh, you know, I, 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 Unfortunate, I'm sort of in the unfortunate position as a freelance journalist that I have to run, you know, my stories like a business. So I have to say, okay, where could I picture this being published? Mm -hmm. 
is high country news interested? Is the Washington post interested? Is this too far afield? Do I need to make it a newsletter or something like that? So there's, there's that kind of practical angle. Um, but then also I have to really think about, is this a world I want to hang out in for yeah. a while, you know, because even for the shortest thing that I write, which is, you know, probably 4,000 words, that's very long for most journalists. There's a ton of investment of time and energy that goes into that. So I have to decide, is this something I know about? How long am I going to hang out in this world? You know, sometimes people will send me really dark topics to work on and I'm just like, man, it's just not for me, you know, and I, and I have to just sort of be okay with making that decision and knowing that I can only work on so many things and maybe I don't want to live in this dark world and I'll choose a different dark world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there, oh, there's a dark world over there. I'll go to yeah. that. Has there been a thing that you're like, yes, the world needs to, and you're beating chest and waving arms and you published it out there and no one cared at all. I mean, I could make an argument that happens with almost everything I do. Uh, you know, I think it's one thing I really like to tell people because I think Bundyville is the thing that made a lot of people know about my work in the West um, was that I tried and failed to sell that 10 times before it became what it was. So mm. I was pitching all kinds of people and, and it really started. I was actually uh, on the hook to write one story about the Las Vegas trial with the Bundys and how it, there was a chance that the entire male side of this LDS family was going to go to prison. What was going to happen? You know, how did that shake their, how was that going to shake their faith? So when that ended in a mistrial, I called my editor and I was like, well, that, I don't think we can do that story anymore, but I have a bunch of ideas. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was really lucky that I had an editor who was like, let's make a podcast. And I was like, okay, I'll figure out how to do that. So, you know, I didn't know, but yeah, I think that is one thing where I had sent that to so many editors and I got rejections saying, nobody cares about the buddies. Nobody cares about these people anymore. <laughs> they're, they're done. They're tired. We're never going to hear from them anymore. And I just kept, I just believed in the idea. So I had to just keep trying, but yeah, I mean, in the news cycle right now, it can be really, really difficult to, to make people care about just about anything. And yeah, I understand that. That's hard. That's a hard thing to know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe people will care as they should. Yeah. Likely yeah. they won't. Yeah. You know, and, and I, and I don't fault people for that. I mean, we are just living in this time where there's just like, how do you hold space for all the different things that are, that are going on. And then you have your personal life. You're trying to be happy at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like I get it. So, um, so I do feel like I try to make work that has a long shelf life, um, that, you know, it's not going to be just over in a week and, and everybody moves on. So that's why I tend to take on more like long form projects, podcasts, you know, books and things like that. Here's why I know you're really good at what you do. When I listened to the uh, second season of Bundyville, get to the end, and I was very unsettled. And I just was like, oh, there, that's what yeah. we're doing. This yeah. is this is the end of that. And, uh, and, and, the, and, you know, you took me on the journey. I'm able to understand these people more. And then I go, who, who are the people that are around me? These people could be that guy that lives next door here. This could happen down the street there. And and I think that that's real. I think that that's the world that we live in. Ooh, but I hated that. I, I was a little mad uh, at the, like the, the honesty, the um, reality of the picture that you painted, especially when you talk about, you know, you're, you're uh, buddying up to these folks and uh, several times you didn't feel physically safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. you're just like, yeah. And so that's the end. And here we are. I'm not physically safe. I hope everybody has a good day. And, you know, the next thing we're going to do, we're talking about a shipwreck, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> come read my shipwreck story yeah. to feel better. Yeah. Um, which, you know, a lot of people like the shipwreck story. Sure. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not down. Yeah, but yeah. I think that's fascinating. I had no idea. I'm, I'm going to, you know, put on an eye patch and read your shipwreck story later. I, you you will love it. So, you know, I mean, I think that you're getting at something that uh, is a, a thing that has long been a big conversation I've had with editors over the years. Is it our responsibility as journalists to end on an uplifting note? Do we say at the end, well, but everything will probably be okay. I don't know. I don't no. know that that's our job. So, you know, so I do feel like with Bundyville, I was trying to, you know, towards the end of that show, I put in a lot of my own personal life because, mm -hmm. you know, when I was living in Spokane, a bombing 
uh, what happened two blocks away from my apartment. You know, Ooh. I couldn't get to my mailbox. I couldn't go in the front door because a white supremacist put a bomb on the route of the Martin Luther King Jr. Parade. And, you know, it didn't go off. Thank God. Um, but at the time I was like, who cares? Like I just didn't, I, even then I didn't care. And, and I, and when I was working on Bundyville, I was like, oh my God, like I have been more closely impacted by this. And even that couldn't shake me enough to, to care about it. So I put that in there because I really wanted to get in the listener's ear and say, like, we should all care that mm -hmm. any bomb gets put on any MLK Jr. parade route in any city mm -hmm. um, because it's on all of us to figure this out. You know, it's not, uh, you know, the president can't say a thing and everybody does it, does it. It's like, you know, you have to, we're all allowing, we're permitting things to be out there and, and to say, you know, we're creating this world together. So we should all be aware. And so, yeah, you know, a lot of times I end stories in an uncomfortable position where with Bundyville specifically, I wanted to make the first line of the show and the last line of the show the same. What are you going to do with that? You know, what do you, what are you personally going to do with this information? Because I thought as a journalist, I, I can't tell you what to do. I don't know what to do, but sure. I want you to think about what you want to do. Um, so yeah. Yeah. But I, uh, uh, I I really appreciated it too because it, it hasn't happened. This sounds like I'm just fanboying. It was great. You're fine. Thank you. I You're okay. It. You're okay. <laughs> I'm all right. Get a big head. You're all right. But what I also loved about it was with several people in my life because I had recommended it to them. It was like get through that episode and call me. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that. And I think that that's that's powerful journalism. Uh, I'm sure that with the uh, Chad Daybell case. Picking up in uh, April of 2024, assuming that as of this recording, it's still going to happen. Then there's been no sort of plea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You'll probably follow that a little bit. But I would be curious as to, you know, I'm I'm uh, trickling down this river here. We're going to be thinking about doing something like that as to what you've got going on in your life. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I the paperback version of When the Moon Turns to Blood just came out, came out and has a new chapter, which is all about Lori's trial. And I just wanted to make sure that that got in there. So, you know, inevitably, I won't be able to stay away completely, I think, from mm -hmm. what happens with Chad. Chad was initially what made me really interested in, in that case and in his writings and his ideas about, you know, the end of the world and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I can't say that if that happens, I won't be in Boise covering it because I'm very interested, but you know, um, that project really kind of flung me in new directions as far as religious ideology. I was very surprised at how new agey a lot of the ideas that Lori and Chad had were, you know, they mm -hmm. had things like crystal pendulums and things talking about portals and stuff like that. And 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 so I decided I wanted to dig more into into new age ideas. I think I thought it would be like a shipwreck story. It might be a little bit of a palate cleanser with a mm -hmm. lot of crystals. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out to be just a further examination of of fringe mm -hmm. <laughs> ideas in America. So I, you know I'm like a bloodhound for that stuff, I guess. But yeah. that's that's kind of what I've been working on. I have a manuscript of an, of another book, kind of in editing on that. Is so, it intersection with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints or mm -hmm. absence of? absence of yeah okay. there's there's a uh, very very little if not at any mention of of the lds church in it but you know it was just really interesting and another i like to tumble into worlds and kind of live in these spaces and that kind of thing so so that was very interesting i'm also on the side working on a project about um the history of of armed fascist groups in the Pacific Northwest, which I think is really interesting back in the 1920s and 30s, kind of yeah. trying to understand more of the origins of the militia movement. And um, and then I'm always working on something that isn't related to the far right. And in this case, I'm, I'm working on a story about a man who spent 25 years in prison and uh, for a crime that he likely didn't commit. So, you know, just kind of using my skills to kind of investigate other things and get into new public records and that kind of thing. Uh, I want to walk you through a scenario that I just sort of thought in my mind. I love the idea of like meeting you at a coffee shop and being like, hey, you know, I'm just having some light conversation. You know, what do you want to talk about? And you're like, well, the armed fascists of the 1920s. And I'm just like, OK, all right. 
<laughs> do you have a hobby? No, no. As I mean, I have to, honestly, I have yeah. to have a hobby because I, I feel like if I only live in that world, I don't have anything to talk to people about. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but I do love it. I love that the idea that I feel like I could connect with you and talk about this kind of stuff forever. The, yeah. Because I just, you know, uh, so very polished in the things that you do and in the way that you portray it for all of us to be able to consume. I think it's it's fascinating. I know that certainly with um, the outcome of the 24 election, there may be some furthering and reporting and who knows what that's going to be like. Gosh, what didn't we just do an election? It just felt it just just what, happened. Wasn't that just yesterday that we yes. did that? So I'm sure that there will be some things with that. Um, yes. Yes. Well, uh, I should tell people, uh, when the moon turns to blood, you can find it. I listened to it. Uh, that's how I consumed it. But uh, both hardback and now you got the softback with the added chapter. Do I get the extra chapter if I did the audio? I don't. No, and unfortunately, no. And and mm. I didn't even explore that option. Maybe it's possible that I could ask my publisher, can I just like record it? I have got a microphone. So we'll, well see. I, but yeah, I, I paid for it. So I'm going to ask that you record it for me and just send it over <laughs> so I can listen to it. I'm teasing. Uh, and then also people can find Bundyville. You can just go to leahsatilli.com. We'll leave a link there. That's all of her projects. And do I know being a, a journalist, there's probably an interesting line um, that you have to walk. If people wanted to contribute to your work, can they do that? Or is that, that's a journalistic no-no? I mean, some journalists do do that. I The way that I do it is I, I don't feel right about, you know, taking donations or anything like that. But I do have a, a newsletter that I send out every month and um, there are paid subscriptions on that. So, oh, cool. you know, if you pay for subscriptions, sometimes I do paid only content, but for the most part, you're just, I, what I like to to do is each month when I send out my newsletter, I say where donations went. You helped mm -hmm. buy public records. You helped me travel to do research at a library and things sure. like that. So yeah. um, And that, that newsletter sign up is on my website as well. Yeah. Another way that I know you're good is because when I bring up donations, it makes you so uncomfortable if people can see just how visibly yeah. you're like, ah, mm, I mean, they can, but I, mean, I really prefer ah. some, you know, I got, I give credit to these younger journalists that are like, you can give money to my cash app and my PayPal and stuff like that. I think I'm just old school enough of a journalist that I'm like, Ugh, it just feels weird. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Leah, there's a question we ask everyone, uh, members of the church or non, uh, we, cause we ask you to interpret this question, however you may, but the question Question that we ask everybody is what their favorite part of their faith is. That is not a question I ever expected to be asked. Um, I think that one of the coolest parts of, of whatever my own spiritual realm is, is that it connects me to other people that are completely unlike me. You know, I meet other people because we have shared ideas or, um, you know, a, a belief that the world could be better if we're all good to each other. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, it, I think that's it. Um, it. It's the way that it helps me understand other people who I would never come in contact with otherwise. Yeah, I love it. Uh, all the things that we mentioned in this uh, available in the show notes, you can find those uh, in accordance with this episode. Leah, we hope that this episode has nourished and strengthened your body, that if you're not healthy enough to listen this week, that you'll be healthy enough to listen next week, and that when the time comes, you'll be able to travel home in safety. In the meantime, we'll be saving a seat for you on the back row of the Cultural Hall. <laughs>